Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to NRW. I'm your host today, Rob the Movie Guy, and I thank you very much for joining me here today because today I'm reviewing one of my all-time favorite films in The Crow. And this year marks the 27-year anniversary of the film's release, which came out back in May 13th, 1994. I never got to see this movie in theaters when it was released, and I'll be honest with you, I don't remember where I saw the film for the first time. But the one thing I do remember for sure is that when I saw the film for the first time, I loved it. I thought it was a very good movie, and... Despite the fact that it was a very dark subject matter that they're that we're dealing with in this story, I still connect with it. In fact, I found it to be a very beautifully told story because uh, it is a very tragic love story at the end of the day. But the way that the characters are are handled and the way that the, that the story is paced and the way that um, everything starts from beginning to end, it's all handled very flawlessly, in my opinion. Now, granted, there are some flaws in the film, but the overall story itself is damn near perfect, in my opinion. And the film stars the late Brandon Lee, and this film does mark his final performance. And I'm sure many of you guys already know this here, but for those that don't, Brandon Lee is the son of the legendary martial arts actor Bruce Lee. And Brandon was accidentally killed on set. And I believe he had no more than about a week's worth of shooting before he was accidentally killed uh, in making this film. And there was there was a bit of concern at the time that the studio was debating on whether or not if they should actually release the movie. Uh, and they said they didn't want to come off as they were trying to sell the film by using Aunt Brandon Lee's death as a way to promote the movie. And I think I forgot what city was involved. I think it might have been Paramount that. I was going to distribute the film, but they ended up backing out and then Miramax got involved and this decided to put more money into it so that way they can finish the film with the blessing of the Lee family. And everyone involved with this project certainly did their best job to make the film uh, what it is today because there is no doubt that they wanted to pay respects to the man and, and Brandon Lee and also honor his legacy because if you were to watch the interviews that he had done prior to making this film, you can see that he was very, very passionate about this project. Do you have another picture will be coming out? I have another picture I'm just getting ready to start work on called The Crow, and uh, I'm real excited about it. It's what pretty is that? interesting. It's uh, a supernatural piece. It's about a rock musician and his girlfriend who are murdered, and he comes back from the dead to revenge his own murder and the murder of the woman that he loved. And uh, it's quite interesting. It's very dark and very surrealistic. He really wanted to make this movie uh, for a number of reasons, but one of those reasons that the story is fantastic, and it really is. And at the same time, he really wanted to try something different with his acting abilities because a lot of people at the time were associating him with being Bruce Lee's son. Obviously he is, but everyone kept comparing him to his father because they thought that maybe he'll go into the action genre and pick up where his father left off. In reality, he just wanted to be a really good actor and do other uh, films, not just the action genre, which a lot of people were trying to uh, uh, put him in. And this was going to be the movie where he was really going to be stepping out of that that uh, that shadow, of, if you will, of his father, where he was going to be doing something completely different, do something that would help define him as a person, him as an actor. And I really believe that he definitely would have had accomplished that in this movie. And there's no doubt in my mind that this film certainly would have made him a superstar because this is by far one of the greatest adapted comic book movies of all time. For those of you guys who don't know this already, um, The Crow, the film, was adapted from a graphic novel of the same name created by the comic writer and James O'Barr. And there's a whole story about that particular story, about that comic book as well, too, that's also very tragic as well. But there was, there's a lot about this movie that really has touched a lot of people in a lot of positive way where people hold this film very close to their heart for a, a number of different reasons. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that Brandon Lee's performance is, in fact, amazing in this movie. So the story of The Crow follows Eric Draven, a rock musician who is revived by a crow to avenge the rape and murder of his uh, fiance Shelley, including his own murder, too. And he goes out to find the men that are responsible, and he kills them all one by one, including their boss, Top Dollar. And once he completes that mission, he then gets reunited with his fiance in the afterlife. And that is pretty much the story right there in a nutshell. Now, there's a lot that I'm leaving out just for the purposes of time that I'm not going to be getting into too much. But I think right now will be the perfect time for me to start to get into my positives. The first positive I'm going to point out is Brandon Lee. Brandon Lee is fantastic in this movie. And if you recall what I said earlier, that if you'd watch interviews that he's done prior to making this movie, 
that you could see he was extremely excited and very passionate about this project. And even when you watch the interviews he's done on set, he still carries that same passion and excitement for the project. And there is no doubt that this is by far his best performance. And unfortunately, he has a, he had a very short-lived uh, movie career. And there is no doubt in my mind that this movie would have put him in a, a whole different level of uh, superstar, if you will. And if you listen to him in, in the past talk about how he's always wanted to be an actor, that, that's what, that was his passion. He really wanted to pursue that career. And he knew it was going to be very difficult for a number of reasons. Uh, one, he is his father's son. And two, um, it's not going to be an easy thing for him to uh, get the get the roles that he wanted to really go after, which are dramatic roles, romantic roles, or whatever the case may be. Anything but action. Not that he was against action. It's just that he wanted to try something else. And this movie, no doubt, would have been the starting point for him where he could really showcase his dramatic beat so he can really showcase his true capabilities of being a really good actor and no doubt had, did he accomplish that with this movie and it's a bittersweet for a lot of people who watch this film because a lot of people um, love his performance and, and has developed a cult following for uh, throughout the years and justifiably so because it is a very good movie but his performance by far is one of the best things about the film in fact whenever you think of the crow you can't help but think of brandon lee because he is essentially the crow he, that that man is the face of the film and it's to his credit because he he really is incredible in this movie and i'm also going to point out too that despite the fact that this is his film but the other actors the supporting characters in this movie also have a moment to shine in this film as well. And one of the great actors in this movie is Ernie Hudson, who plays the character of Sergeant Albrecht in the film. And his performance in this movie is amazing, in my opinion. And the chemistry that he shares with Brandon Lee on the screen is nothing short of fantastic. I believe that this character could have gone wrong in so many different ways because he definitely does play a smart-ass B-cop in this movie and it's a very generic role if you think about it but his performance and the backstory that we do get of this character because we actually do get to spend some time with the character to actually connect with him at least i certainly did and it's not a shoe shoehorn in story to put in there for the sake of putting it in there it's actually very integral to the plot and the connection that he has with both shelly and eric in the film um, is a very important one at that especially towards the end of this movie and I, I got to give a lot of credit to the man because he is so good and really uh, balancing out the, the, I guess you could say the comedy uh, with the character that he brings to a lot of the scenes in this movie, but also balancing out the, the, the heart of, of the film as well too, where he really was there deep in this whole investigation and his involvement in trying to solve the case, but meeting some major roadblocks. So. There is no doubt that this journey was also important for him as well, too, for him to come full circle uh, to, I guess, overcome the inner demons that he's been dealing with, uh, especially since the death of both Eric and Shelley. And the actress Rochelle Davis, who plays the character of Sarah in this movie, is another standout performance for me. If I remember hearing correctly, I think this was her first acting role ever, if I remember hearing correctly. And I couldn't tell because, again, I think she was so good in this part. And what I loved about the character is that, yes, she is a, a, a tough street girl, but it, it never felt forced. It wasn't her being tough for the sake of being tough. It was a very organic part of the story that was very integral to the plot, too. And if I remember correctly, because I've, I've read the comic books twice um, since I've seen the film, and I, I remember her being in the, in the comic book, but she never had a big role like she does in the film. It's more like a, a minor role, if you will, in the comic book. So they definitely did a really good job to expand the character story to fit this narrative, which I thought was very fitting uh, with the direction they were going with. And again, her performance in this movie is nothing short of fantastic in this film. And as for the villains, I love every single one of those characters. In my opinion, I believe each one of these actors portraying the villains in this film do have a moment to shine where they can really showcase some great performances in this movie but also at the same time provide a certain uniqueness about each of these characters that make them stand out for you to connect with at least that's how it was for me and one of those characters for me was top dollar played by the actor michael wincott when you look at top dollar there's something unique about that character he has he certainly has a very creepy factor about him because he has that tall lanky uh, uh body 
the long hair, that voice, and that it just when you look at that face, he, he has a face of a villain. And what's interesting about this character is that out of all the villains, he's the only one that you really do have a bit of a background on, where they just sprinkle enough enough exposition for you to get some sort of background about him but the rest you just got to figure out for yourself along the way for you to put the pieces together and and one of those aspects of him is the relationship that he has with his sister played by the actress Bai Ling who I actually liked in the movie although I kind of have a bit of a mixed reaction about the use of the character not in a negative light but I'll get into that later on but what was interesting about that relationship is that when you look at Shelly and um Eric Draven's relationship you can see that as that is pure love that that comes from a good spot and it's a, it's a very uh, romantic relationship and it's a it's a pure one at that if you will whereas in Top Dollar and his sister I, I believe her name is uh, Mika or Mika in the film well there is hinted at there they're having a very incestual relationship and, and with a little bit of the background you get it seems like they kind of had a pretty fucked up uh, back a childhood from from what I can gather and and you're seeing that flip side of, of the pure love uh, loving relationship that you have between Shelly and Eric, and then you get the villains on the other hand who are in a incestual, dark, you know, weird relationship, if you will. And I found that to be very interesting because I never really picked up on that uh, when I first started watching the movie so many years ago, and then. As the years have gone by, I started to notice little things about the film here and there, and that's one of the more newer things that I happen to uh, become more aware of about that relationship. And I found that to be a very interesting um, parallel between the two uh, uh, couples, if you will. And Candyman himself, Mr. Tony Todd, is playing a character in the movie by the name of Grange, who is essentially like the right-hand man to Top Dollar in this gang. And I love the way this character is portrayed in this movie because... He's more like a shadow in this film. He, he's definitely very loyal to Top Dollar. And you can clearly see that these guys have a, a very strong partnership. And what, what was interesting about that is that um, you, can make a, you can make a comparison between uh, Eric Draven and uh, Sergeant Albrecht, played by Ernie Hudson in this movie, where they're forming an alliance with one another. And they, you can see where that relationship gets developed and they form that partnership. Whereas with the villains, on the other hand, with Grange and Top Dollar, They've already had this uh, relationship established and you don't really know how they form this alliance with one another, but you believe it because the, the actors do a really good job in selling that performance and really making you believe that they are, they've been with each other from, from the very beginning, if you will. And that's a testament to Tony Todd where whenever he is trying to confirm someone's uh, alibi to about, in this case with Eric Draven, that one of the uh, characters in the movie uh, by the name of uh, Gideon, played by the actor John Polito, who is fantastic in the movie as well, too. He's telling the story about how he encountered Eric Draven, and then Eric Draven was um, doing these uh, this these uh, Im immortal acts where he's getting shot up, but he's, he's able to recover from his wounds and not having suffering any injuries, and he's able to do other other uh, incredible things as well. And Top Dollar's questioning him, but then Granger comes as well. He's actually telling the truth because I seen him do this and he's like, all right, I, I take your word for it. And then right there, that establishes where these two are coming from. You right then and there, you believe that, okay, they have a partnership that is very strong and they trust each other's words. That's how I perceive this. So that's one aspect about the story that I truly, truly admire where you don't get a lot of exposition, but just by the conversations that these characters are having with one another, you can seriously see where that bond is tight between them, and I love that. And we can't forget about the four soldiers that are under Top Dollar's gang. And as I mentioned earlier that each of these actors portraying the villains in this movie, they all offer a wonderful performance that makes these characters that they, they're portraying stand out for, for you to remember them by. And you have the characters such as T-Bird, who is the leader of the gang, or at least of the four guys here, played by the actor David Patrick Kelly, who is phenomenal in this movie. And then you also have the, uh, the character in Skank, who is a personal favorite of mine, played by the actor Angel David, where he is a speedhead, where he talks like at 100 miles per hour, and you can't understand half the things that he's saying. And he actually has some of the funniest bits in the movie as well for me. 
And you also have the character of Tintin, who specializes with knives, played by the actor uh, Lawrence Mason, who is phenomenal in this movie. And then you also have the character of Fun Boy, played by the late actor Michael Massey. Now, the one thing I will point about um, these characters is that when you first get introduced to these characters, they are all at a arcade shot that they're setting up to explode. And then they meet up at a bar where they're drinking shots with Bulletin and you can see that these guys don't really like each other that much, but they tolerate one another because they work well with one another and they obviously make money together. And it's not until when you get some one-on-one -on -one time with them where you really get a feel of how, how terrible they really are. And you first get a sense of that when you first are having a one-on-one -on -one moment with the character of Tintin. And you can see that this guy is not someone you wanna be around. And then when Eric confronts him and kills him, it's a it's a very justified and, and satisfying kill for that matter. But from there, you start to have an idea like how terrible these guys really, really are when you have that one-on-one -on -one time with them. Because then from that point on, as Eric confronts each one of these, these characters, you learn a little bit about their personality more and more, not about their background, but really just about the individuals themselves where they're willing to sell someone else out just to save their own lives and and they're willing to put other people in the crossfires just to help themselves get out of the, this uh this uh shootout that they may be in or whatever else that's going on at that particular moment and again that's where i think they the, the performances also stand out too because you're seeing like that what fun wild side about them that's that's very intriguing but then you also see that very down and dirty side too which made me uh, appreciate the characters a little bit more because the performances by these actors is nothing short of amazing. And I also want to point out too that the actor in Michael Massey who plays the character of Fun Boy, this is the man that had uh, accidentally killed Brandon Lee on the set of the movie. And it's an unfortunate thing that he had gone through because I, if I remember reading correctly, he had stepped away from acting for well over a year because he had nightmares about what, it, what, what had happened, of course. And it's something that he had to live with this and it's something that I'm not going to pretend to understand what that feels like um, because I can't imagine what what that's like what, what that was like for him and I only came across one interview that he had done where he did talk about that incident and it's the only one that I'm aware of that he's done that he's commentated about what had happened where he discussed that at least in a public format and, and in that interview you can clearly see that he's not very comfortable in talking about that and it's not a disturbing interview by any means but it is a pretty sad one because you can clearly see that you, he still has that guilt about that. And um, he has made mention that the reason why he never discussed about it publicly to anybody uh, about this is because he felt like it was none of their business. The only people that he felt like uh, that would have the, the I guess you could say the authority to really talk with him about that would be his family, including, his, including Brandon's uh, fiance, who he was gonna marry after he had finished shooting this movie. And he felt like that was the, they were the only people that had the right to talk to him about that and question him about that and, and discuss on the matter. Um, but for everyone else, he felt like it was none of their business and they weren't there, therefore they're not involved. So he hadn't he didn't have to talk with them about that at all. So I respected him for that too. But unfortunately, he had passed away back in 2016, I believe. I, I believe from cancer. Um, so you know, I can't imagine having to carry that for the rest of your life, what that must have been like for him. But rest in peace, Michael, because his performance as Fun Boy in this movie was nothing short of amazing, in my opinion. One of my favorite aspects of the story is the relationship between Sarah and her mother, Darla, played by the actress Anna Levine. And one of the reasons why I love this part of the story between these two characters is because, as I talked about before, that you, you get a bit of exposition to get an idea of what's going on, and then you have to fill in the rest with uh, with whatever other details are given to you through interactions that some of these characters have with other characters. In this particular case here with Sarah and her mother Darla, um, you when you first meet Sarah, she's on her own. She's out in the streets skateboarding and she's clearly a, a very uh, strong-willed person, a, a, a tough person at that. But she's also yearning to be back with her mother. When she goes sees her mother at the bar that where her mother works at, where she is serving Tintin, T-Bird, Skank, and Fun Boy, um, you can see that when she looks at her mother and how she behaves around these people, that she's obviously very disappointed and does ha show some concern for her. But at the same time, 
um, knows that her mother is not gonna really care about her own well-being. And then it's not until when Eric comes over to that bar and finds Funboy with Darla, where he obviously takes out Funboy and Darla, fearing for her life, uh, gets confronted by Eric and he's telling her, you gotta go see your daughter. Your daughter's out in the streets by herself. She needs her mother. She wants to reconnect with you. So go and do that. And then drains all the blood out of her, or not blood, I meant to say the drugs out of her arms. And it's a wonderful scene too. Uh, it's a really effective one too, I would say. And then the, the following day, Darla is trying to make breakfast for her daughter uh, like she used to because apparently from the dialogue that you have between her and her daughter that she used to do that sort of stuff so obviously they have a they had a good relationship at one point but then again somewhere along the way they they sort of drift apart and a lot of it had to do most likely with uh, darla from what we're from what's being hinted at but sarah's a uh, looks at her mother and feels like this is some, some bullshit act because she's always done this before. That's what's hinted at with her reaction. And then when Darla sees that her daughter doesn't seem to care, she's like, fuck this, I'm trying, what's the point? Because you don't care. And then Sarah realizes, wait a minute, I think she's legit and she's actually trying. Okay, I want my eggs done like this. And then they slowly start reconnecting and they have a wonderful uh, moment together. And that was just enough. I mean, not a lot of time is spent between the two in that regard, but the, the very little time that we do get spent with them, uh, it's a very effective one. And it def and I connected with that story because I understood with where they're coming from because both of these actors, uh, Rochelle Davis who plays Sarah and uh, Anna Levine playing her mother, Darla, do a really good job. And, and, I, and, and I think that's one of the best things about this movie is that, like I said before, each of these characters have a moment to shine where you can really connect with them and understand where they're coming from. And then when they come full circle, if you will, um, it pays off very well. And the look of the film is one of the more iconic things about this movie because it definitely has that gothic, uh, dark overtone to it, which is very prevalent throughout the film. And it also has this very uh, gritty and realistic feel to it as well that makes it so unique. And a lot of it does have to do with the director and Alex Proyas, who I believe was making his directorial debut with this project, but he did have a background in directing music videos prior to this film. And you can certainly see the influences that films such as Ridley Scott's Blade Runner had at, had on this film, including Tim Burton's Batman, that certainly did show in this movie. But despite that, you can you can see that this film has formed its own identity because there's such a unique look about this film that any film since then that has tried to emulate that, people would automatically think, well, this is just like The Crow. And one of those clear examples for me personally, and I never actually looked into whether or not this was actually even the case, but if it if it is it made sense um when i saw the film the matrix in theaters one of the the first things i remember about that movie when i saw the opening of this movie where trinity is running from the agents and she's going from rooftop to rooftop there's something about the that the way that the film was directed in that particular sequence that reminded me so much of the crow where you have eric draven running from rooftop to rooftop to find the next uh, villain in this movie although it was raining at that time in this particular scene with the matrix it wasn't but even though the matrix had a distinct look to it where it had it certainly did have a little bit of that gothic feel to it to a point um but it had a much more cleaner palette to it whereas in the crow of course they didn't really have it was a much more dirtier it kind of had that almost like that 70s vibe to it with a very gritty feel to it which i thought was beautiful in this movie and it worked very well for this film but there's no doubt in my mind that when i saw that scene in the matrix that i automatically thought this is clearly inspired by The Crow. There's no doubt that one of the best things about this movie is the soundtrack. And if anyone's ever seen the review that I've done for the 1995 Mortal Kombat film, you know that in that review, I talked about how I think the soundtrack to that film is one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard in my life. But I also did talk about how I believe that The Crow soundtrack is by far, I think, the best soundtrack I've ever heard in my entire life. And a lot of it does have to do with the comic creator in James O'Barr, who has certainly had an influence and have helping putting this out this soundtrack together and a lot of the bands that are featured in that soundtrack he was actually friends with um having worked as a, a writer for I, for I forgot what rock magazine it was back in the uh early to late to mid early 90s but uh if i remember hearing correctly he had asked each one of these bands that are featured in the soundtrack with the exception of maybe one or two uh to contribute a song in the soundtrack but the the stipulation was that they cannot use that song in any of their other albums or the B-sides. That song had to be used solely for that soundtrack, and that was it. And they all seem to agree to it because they contributed a song um, for, to the soundtrack. And you have bands like 
uh, Nine Inch Nails, uh, the Rollins Band uh, that was formed, that was a group that Henry Rollins had formed back in the 90s, uh, Rage Against Machine, of course, The Cure, uh, Pantera, Helmet, many other groups as well. And what's so fascinating about this soundtrack too is that there's a wide spectrum of like rock music that's used in, in this soundtrack. You have, again, The Cure, which is known for like this weird uh, post-punk uh, uh, type of music that they, that they uh, were playing. And of course, uh, Nine Inch Nails, which were at the time were known for more like industrial type of music. And of course, you have Pantera, which are a heavy metal band. Rage Against Machine was certainly was a, a metal band, but they were starting to form their own uh, style of music uh, back in the early 90s. And and you also have uh, other softer groups as well, too, that weren't as heavy with groups like Medicine. That was a band that was actually featured in the film with the performance that they were doing for a song called Time Baby 3. And a little trivia fact about that band. So Brandon Lee's sister, Shannon Lee, is also a singer in, in her in real life. And she actually ended up joining that same band, Medicine, years and years later. So I thought it was interesting that the band that was featured in her brother's last film, she was a member of that band years after the fact. And I've actually was able to hear some of the songs that she sang with the group. Uh, and I actually do like it. It's definitely not, I think, a, a a group that will appeal to everybody, but I did grow to like, I thought she was actually a really good singer uh, with what she was able to contribute uh, at the time with the band. And and one thing I love about this movie when it came to the use of the music is that it never felt shoehorned in. It, it, it was done effectively in my opinion. In, in some cases, uh, sometimes you don't even know that the songs are playing in the background, but when they are playing in the background and you, and you pick up on that, it's not distracting by any means. It's very, it works well for the scene. And that's why I love this movie because a lot of times you'll get films that are are promoting the the other byproducts of the film, the soundtrack or whatever else, and they'll put in a song to get people to become interested to go out and buy the album. And of course, that's obviously the case here, but the way that it's done is so effective that the, the work speaks for itself and people went out of the way to go find this uh, soundtrack and buy it and it was very successful at the end of the day. And the score to the movie done by the composer Graham Ravel is amazing. I love the score to this film and in my opinion I believe that Graham Ravel is one of the most underrated composers out there in the industry because if you watch the movie and listen to the score you'll understand where I'm coming from because that score is just beautiful and in my opinion I believe some of, the, some of his best work in the film comes when it's when it deals with some of the more softer moments of the film the more emotional aspects of the film that's where i really think he um shows his strength because it's beautiful how that's handled one of my favorite scenes in the movie uh, is between sarah and eric when they get reunited for the first time since he died and the build up to that scene is beautiful because sarah discovers that eric's alive and is trying to reconnect with him he's avoiding her for her safety and then she expresses her sadness how she feels alone and needs a friend and believes that and she, she desperately misses both Eric and Shelly because they were her closest friends. And when Eric's not responding to her, she's about to walk away. And then he comes out and says, hey, and then they reunite. It's a beautiful moment in the film. But the music cues done by Graham Rebell is, in my opinion, just beautiful. Like, I, I love it so much. And it's a really impactful and beautiful moment in the movie. It's one of my favorites, as I said, from this film. And as I mentioned before, that I think that Graham Rebell is a really underrated composer because it seems like a lot of the movies he does doesn't really have that kind of impact in the industry where people will remember his work. But if you take the time to listen to his score, it's really good stuff, especially with movies like he's done, for example, like Street Fighter, which is my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time. If you listen to the score on that film, it's beautiful. It's really, really good, including the score that he did for the Mighty Morphin's Power Rangers movie that came out in 95. You listen to that score, that score is amazing too. It's He's done some really solid work, um, but I hope that you know in time people will recognize his his uh, his his compositions of all the things he's done throughout the throughout the years with the films he's worked on because it's, it's amazing work in my opinion. And I can go on and on on what it is about this film that I love, but that would just take forever. So I will close out with my positives by saying this. I love this movie. I think this movie is handled beautifully in my opinion the directing the writing the editing the cinematography the set designs the acting the score the music everything about this film i i absolutely love and for me the best thing about this film are no doubt the characters because this is a very character driven piece in my opinion and the 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 fact that you get to spend time with a lot of these characters and really get to know them well and have that 
that chance to get a feel for them is not something that can be easily accomplished in most movies. And the fact that they were able to pull this off with just about every major character in this film and a film that's under two hours, uh, I think they, they succeeded in that department. I will say this about one character as kind of a segue to get into my negatives, although my negatives about this film are really more just mixed reactions that I have about the film. And that has to do with the character of Shelley. And in this movie, you don't really get to spend a lot of time with her, but the little time you do spend with her in this movie, you understand how important she is to Eric, especially also to, to the character of Sarah too. Because in the beginning of the movie, you do get to spend some time with her just after she got beaten and raped by, by the gangs in this movie. And she's about to be put into the ambulance. And in that one particular moment in the film, she expresses concern for Sarah. Because when you watch the movie, you understand that Sarah comes from a broken home. Her mom is practically never there to look out for her, to take care of her. She's out on the streets on her own with virtually no friends and out to take care of herself. So... When you see the flashback sequences involving with Sarah and, and Shelly, you see that, that Sarah has a really strong relationship with uh, Shelly in this movie, including with Eric as well, as you see in that reunion they have in the movie. And that is where she felt her, her most safest in, in, in those times with them. So when Shelly, knowing that she's probably gonna be dead at any moment, she's expressing concern for her friend Sarah to have someone look out for her to protect her, knowing that she doesn't have a really good home to go to. And I think that was a very integral moment that really sets the the tone of who she is as a person and why she's such an important character and the, the driving force for the story, if you will. And I think that was handled really well. But then this will be the part where I'll be kind of getting into my negatives. The first real mixed negative reaction that I have about the film has to do with the use of the character of Sarah. You don't really spend enough time with Shelly. In fact, one of the problems that I have with the film is that the flashback sequences that you do get with the character are really too short. You don't really get a feel for how Eric and Shelly met for the first time. Any sort of hurdles that they had to overcome for you to really get a sense of how how tight th this couple really is with one another, like how how truly in love they are with one another you really just have to take it upon face value but it's still done effectively in my opinion i think it def definitely establishes that these guys are madly in love with one another and this tragic event had occurred and now eric's out to take revenge on the men that had taken her away from him and him having the opportunity to be able to reunite with her in the afterlife, which was, I think, done effectively. So it wasn't handled terribly. It just was the fact that it, not enough time was spent with her for you to really get a feel for the character. The other mixed negative reaction that I have about this movie has to do with the character of Mika or Mike. I always forget how you pronounce the character's name despite how many times I've watched the movie, played by the actress Bai Ling. Um, Bai Ling is great in the film, so I'm not saying that the character was horrible in the movie. In fact, she's great. She definitely has a presence about her. The biggest problem that I have is that you don't really get to spend enough time with the character. Like Shelly, you you definitely feel her presence and you understand her importance, but you just don't really have a lot to connect with, with the character. Uh, not like how you would with, say, for example, like her brother, Top Dollar. Uh, the only thing you really get some insight about her is that she is the half-sister to Top Dollar, and she's involved with witchcraft or sorcery or whatever else but i would have liked to spend more time with her to really truly get a feel for the character really understand where she's coming from because she there was something so fascinating about that character that i really wanted to learn more about and you don't really have that time to spend with her now the last real mixed negative reaction that i have about this movie has to do with the special effects and the green screen in this film but I will point out that I do believe the film has aged very well. In fact, this movie does have a timeless feel to it. I believe 30 years from now, whoever were to watch it for the first time uh, will, will most likely agree that this movie does has aged very well. But when it comes to the, the special effects and the green screen in this movie, uh, there are two scenes that come to mind right now that I can point out where it has not aged well at all. And that has to do with the rooftop scene where Eric Draven is running from rooftop to rooftop to get to the bad guy. There's one particular sequence where you can clearly see that the green screen has just not uh, aged well at all. And there's also a moment in the movie where Fun Boy shoots Eric Draven in the hand. And you can see where the hole in, in Eric's hand starts to close up. 
that part of the sequence hasn't aged well at all either. But again, that has a lot to do with the, the how the special effects were at that time and the budget that they had as well too. Um, to, nowadays, the special effects have gotten a bit cheaper for the most part and you can easily make that more realistic nowadays. But back in those days, that was a brand new thing. So it was something that they were having to learn as they go. And as the years have gone by, that has certainly gotten better with the tools they've been able to get throughout the years. But despite those flaws, as I mentioned before, like I said before, I think the film has aged very well. I wanna talk about the sequels real quick before I get into my rating. And I guess you could consider this to be a quick review of each one of those films. I will point out that the one good thing that I think each film does is try to tell a different story with a new character um, as the crow. I thought that was a very smart thing to do. But again, none of those movies hold a candle to the first film. The second movie, The Crow City of Angels, which came out two years after the first film. And I remember first seeing the film at home on pay-per-view when pay-per-view was a thing back in those days. And I distinctly remember thinking that this was not a very good film. But I will give credit, though, that... Visually, the movie looks beautiful, but the story itself was just okay. And the actor who plays the new Crow, uh, Vincent Perez, I thought was good. But again, the story just wasn't that great. And the third movie, uh, The Crow Salvation, uh, which I believe came straight to DVD, you can see that the quality and the, and the production value has dropped a great deal. And so the, you see that there was not a lot of money that was being spent on this movie. And it was clearly one of those things that they just had to make another film to keep the rights to this uh, this IP. And despite the fact that it does have some good actors in the movie, you have Kirsten Dunst, Eric Mabius. Um, you also have Walton Goggins in the movie as well. Despite those actors, the, the movie just wasn't very good. And it wasn't even memorable. Uh, there's a lot of things about this movie that I had forgotten about that I don't remember what had happened. I've only seen it once, but I just remember distinctly thinking it's just not a very good film. Now, the fourth movie, on the other hand, uh, I remember that movie very well because I was curious to see what they were going to do with this movie because they had announced that Edward Furlong was going to be playing the new Crow in this movie. And that was enough for me to be interested in at least checking out the project and i rented that movie i saw with a, a very good friend of mine and we both just were so disappointed with this movie we didn't expect this movie to be any good but we just didn't realize how terrible this movie is going to be um the acting in this movie is so over the top just really really um terrible the dialogue in this movie is, is flat out garbage in my opinion and despite the fact that you have some really, I mean, I'm talking about really good actors in this film. I mean, Edward Furlong is not a terrible actor. He's a very good actor. David Boreans, who I, I believe is how you pronounce his name, who played Angel in the Buffy Vampire series, and he ended up getting his own series as well, along with the uh, TV show that he had done uh, called Bones, I believe. He's a really good actor, and in this movie, he's terrible. And you have a legendary actor in Dennis Hopper, who has been in some of the most iconic films of all time. And he's also in one of my favorite movies of all time in True Romance. Like, he's great in that movie. And he's a really solid actor who knows how to deliver his lines effectively. But in this movie, his acting is fucking terrible. And the dialogue that he has to say in this movie is awful. So it's like each film got worse and worse and in every aspect. And it's unfortunate because I know that the intention is to make a good film, but unfortunately that was not the case. So now this will be the perfect segue for me to get into my rating for The Crow. And as I've already said before, I love this movie. I think this movie's damn near perfect. So for me, I give this movie a solid cheers. <laughs> And those are my thoughts on the movie. I would love to hear you guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and make sure you also share and like our videos and also hit that notification bell down below. And also follow us on our social media accounts. We have a Facebook and Instagram page at New Release Wednesdays and on Twitter at The NRW. And you can follow me on my social media accounts. You can follow me on Instagram, Rob underscore Medina 0585 and on Twitter, Rob Medina 0585 and on Facebook, simply just Rob the Movie Guy. And I thank you guys very much for joining me here today. I hope you guys enjoy this review and until next time, everybody, stay safe out there and cheers. Cheers.